around. Um, this was Wolfgang's first restaurant here in Las Vegas back in 1991. Oh, wow. It, we actually opened during NFR, which was really kind of fun. We were the first outdoor um, open kitchen here in Las Vegas. We had a lot of the cowboys coming up, asking for plates, thinking it was a buffet. Um, and Wolfgang, you know, a lot of people were like, what are you doing going to Las Vegas? So he really has set the trend for fine dining here in the city. And it's not just the city, it's the whole world, right? I think it is now, you know, before it was always New York was kind of the dining mecca, but Las Vegas definitely gave them a run for their money. This is a beautiful place. Thank you. And so you were mentioning having any kind of event and you can do a thousand people. Where do you put a thousand well, people? Well, we actually, between our outdoor cafe, our main dining room, and then we have a private dining space upstairs, balcony space. So when we have cocktail receptions, we have people mingling all over. All up and down. All up and down. And so they rent the whole place at one time. The whole place. Oh, wow. wow. That's awesome. And we all do. kind of celebrities. We do a lot of celebrities, we do a lot of sports figures, we do a lot of uh, political events. So this morning, we actually don't have any events here today. We are basically getting ready to open for lunch service. So we go through, obviously, the majority of what it takes to open up a restaurant in a day. We make sure that things are clean, things are set. We make sure our reservations are confirmed. We make sure that, obviously, our kitchen team back here is starting to do all of their prep work. This is a lunch and dinner restaurant, so we obviously have a very heavy volume. So we're in the kitchen right now. It's a little bit quiet because we actually haven't got started for lunch yet, but I want to take a minute and introduce you to our executive chef, Eric Klein. Hello, Eric. Nice to meet Hello, you. How are you? Nice uh, to have you over here. Yeah. Patrick. So, Chef, would you mind giving us a little tour Absolutely. of the kitchen? Absolutely. Let me Thank show you, you. what we're working on. Thank you. So right here, our kitchen is very different. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things. Actually, we're working on one of your party right here. This is rice pepper. We make it from scratch for the party for like house-made rice pepper pop. And it's coming exactly, and it's fantastic. I love it, Chef. It's beautiful. Cool, right here. Let me show you a little bit on the bread, what we're working right now, so you can see. You can see the guys are all working right now, making all the new dough. Good morning. For the, for the Good morning. bread. Good morning. Right here. So we have prepared also right here for the German party. We're going to create a special menu. Mm -hmm. We made small pretzels. Large pretzels like the German styles also. We may also make some pumpernickels. You can try later on to see what's up with that fits, what you want to do. Um, we also came up with a new salad like the shibata bread, basically for like more Italian team food. And cherry walnut bread and the multi seed bread as well we have right now. so cool. I have never been in a kitchen like this and since I'm not much of a cook I am amazed at everything. He's, he's amazing. Well thank you. Yes, Chef Eric is amazing. He is an extremely talented culinary. I mean he's a culinary genius. Yeah. He is. There's nothing he touches that he does not turn into gold. And makes special. He really makes our events absolutely amazing. He makes my job very easy but he's my work husband. Like we work hand in hand. You know it takes a team of people to make these events happen. Sure. How long has he been with you? Um, Eric has been with Wolf almost 20 years. I've been with Wolf for 17. So we've all really grown up together. <laughs> into the hospitality in the event world. I actually got my real estate license at 18, and then I went into stocks and bonds, and I was a young girl, and I just, it wasn't fun to me. It was just a lot of boring work. So, And you I, grew up in California, right? I did. I'm a beach girl, Huntington Beach. And so why Vegas? I had done an event. I was working for a restaurant group in Orange County, and I had done an event for Caesars Palace. They had actually called me on New Year's Eve, and I thought, oh, hey, so great to hear from you. Are you guys ready to plan another event so soon? And they said, no, we actually want to offer you a job. Wow. And so I was kind of, I, I was hesitant at first, and, but I was a young girl, and I thought, well, if I don't like it, I can move home. And they really rolled out the red carpet for me. They flew me out first class. They had a limo waiting for me. I had two amazing job interviews, one that was one-on-one, -on -one, one that was a panel. Oh, it was wow. nerve-wracking. And I had worked for Caesars for two years. I had met Wolfgang and his partners. And at the time, Wolfgang had the vision that you see today um, of having a multi-level restaurant group. And when they had approached me, I was actually doing the president of Caesars daughter's wedding. So I was very close 
with the president, the VP of Food and Beverage. Thank you. And I really wasn't looking to leave. And I actually turned down the job the first time that they had offered it to me. And I said, thank you, but no thank you. I, I love the idea, I love the concept, I love where you're going with it. And then three months later, they circled back with me. So he came back, he came back. So he came back, in. they offered me the job, and I said, well, I'm one of those people that I think everything happens for a reason, and I'm gonna take it, And but I just instantly fell in love the day that I got here. And I knew that it would be fun to be part of a project that had just so many amazing plans on the horizon. I mean, Wolf is a true visionary when it comes to fine dining. So did you know people when you came from California to Vegas? like? It was I, sounds I no exciting. You knew nobody. I knew nobody. I had my best friend came out with me. She dropped me off. We unpacked. We cried at the airport. And here I was in this big city all alone. See, this does make me emotional. <laughs> She's still my best friend. We've been friends since junior high. Oh, the one that came out with you. Yeah. Does she still live in California? Yes. So that's that was exciting and yet stressful. It was very exciting and very stressful. I kind of was in this big city that obviously with, you know, nothing but lights and 24-7 and so many things to do and I kind of was just wandering around for a long time. So I really threw myself into work. Okay, so all the big events, I know just from hearing that you, you've entertained presidents and all kind of celebrity people. What, what in your thinking back would be one of the most memorable events to you? Well, there's so many, it's hard to choose. I'd say one that I'm really proud of is that we have some clients who own a hotel chain and I've done business with them for the 17 years that I've been with Wolf. I also knew him as we were young kids running around Newport before any of us moved to Las Vegas. And he was having an intimate dinner for President Obama right when he had come into office and it was the first private dinner of a small group of 22 guests that the President had done. And they were actually at their home in Laguna Beach and he pretty much said, this is all you. We're giving it all to you. We're showing up the day of the event. And so, you know my house, you know my housekeepers, anything that you need, just go ahead and go there. So I figured, well, this is either a make it or break it. It's either gonna give me job security or it's gonna give me a severance package. <laughs> <laughs> so it was at their home. It was, So yes. you catered food and people and everything, everything to the everything, home. Everything, everything, all yeah. the way up until like, Things that people probably don't even realize, like two days before when we have a secret service come in and they do a clearance of the house and they wanted windows blacked out. So last minute we're going and we're working with our decorator and we're getting foam core cut out and window placements in, painting it to match the house. And just a lot of small attention to detail for these events. And overall right now, Wolfgang has 26 fine dining restaurants. All over the world. Yes. And so you're specific. You take care of all of these here. Do you have to travel a lot too? I handle all of Las Vegas. I handle Maui. I have done consulting for some of our other fine dining restaurants when they open and they're looking to get their fine dining and catering program up and running. So you're busy. I'm a busy girl. And so on the busy girl part, um, we met obviously because she's a barrel racer. So uh, when I met her, she comes to a clinic and, and she has a horse and we're talking horses and it's all good. And I could tell she was a little bit different just because she's always so pretty. But um, I, got, I got tickled when I asked Kimberly why she was running barrels. She said, I, I'm doing that for fun. And yet she's hugely competitive. So my question is, why and how? Did you decide to buy a barrel horse instead of a golf club? I actually hate golf. <laughs> um, I would prefer to be at the spa rather than four hours of golf. But now instead I travel four hours to make an 18 second run to get back in the truck to make another four hour <laughs> drive home because that is fun to me. But being a beach girl, we really weren't around horses so I didn't really have a lot of exposure to that. And then one day of all places, I was at a client suite at NASCAR and I met this lovely gal who reached out to me a couple weeks later and she's like, hey, do you want to take some barrel racing lessons with me? Because it just it came up in conversation. And I said, you know what, I would love that. She was a super cool girl and I thought it'd be fun to hang out with her again. She had ridden horses, I didn't. I mean, I didn't even know how to groom a horse, walk a horse, I knew nothing. So I said, why don't I take a couple private lessons and see if maybe I can somewhat catch up with you? She ended up quitting. Well, after about three months of taking lessons, and this is just me, I said, I need a horse. I need a horse, so now I need to buy one. I need to come out whenever I want. I want to be able to ride, and it's just, it stuck with me. How old were you? I started at 40. 
Wow, that's awesome. So here we are, six years later. So the first year after learning to ride, I decided now I need to get a finished barrel horse. So I got a finished barrel horse, and unfortunately I only had him for 10 months because he had some health issues and then I had to put him down. Mm, that's very heartbreaking challenging. in the beginning. I didn't, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to groom. I didn't know how to saddle. I mean, if someone would have told me that, I didn't even know how to drive a truck and a trailer. And I'm, I'm still not great at backing up. <laughs> but So it was a lot, I mean, it's, it's been a lot that I like to challenge myself. And like you said, I, I'm competitive in the aspect of I don't like to fail at things. So I push myself to succeed at whatever it is that I'm doing. So whether that be my career, whether that be barrel racing, um, anything in life. Okay, so at what point in time did you realize you were really in love with barrel racing? Like not just the horse and the the relationship with the horse, but the barrel racing itself? I'd have to say probably when I had gotten my gelding that I have now. And he has really... I. I'll never be able to repay this horse for what he has taught me and what he has brought to my life. Until you got him, his name is Six. His name is Six. His registered name is Honor Double D Money. And he is by Honor Ladybug. He's a direct grandson of Jet of Honor and he looks just like his granddaddy. And then he is out of Double D Bar Dock. He's just nothing on the bottom side but Dock Bar. Yeah. And he is 18 years young and he acts like he's five. And you have placed in the 1D on this horse. When I got this horse, yes, he took me from the 3D to the 1D. I did get my pro card just to go out and I got my permit just to go out and have fun and to challenge myself. Because when I got him, they had shared with me, if you really want to see this horse come alive, you need to take him to a rodeo. And boy, he comes alive. And so at first you went to the slag because you were insecure? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't want, I was so nervous. It was beyond like, I'm like, no, I don't want anybody to watch me. I don't want to see this. And then my girlfriend talked me into, my hauling partner at the time, talked me into entering the NAMI rodeo. Let's go ahead and enter the performance. And after that, it was hook, line, and sinker. You know, when I first started entering performances, it was so nerve wracking. It was like, before you knew it, you were in the gate, out the gate. You know, and then by the end of that first summer, which we actually went, the first time that we did this, we went on the 4th of July run. Oh and my And so gosh. we hit seven rodeos in eight days. <laughs> and so my confidence was up, you know, and, and all of a sudden I'm making a run at a rodeo that I absolutely remember everything. Like I remember the turn, I remember what the announcer's saying, I remember the crowds, and it took a long time to get there. It wasn't an overnight deal. I'm just laughing too, because everything you've done, you kind of jump all in with both feet. So no, like, I'm a nut. you know. <laughs> I'm a nut, I'm not a normal person. He's so easy being finished. Really just walk him out, kind of ask him to give me his shoulders a little bit, break in the rib cage for me a little bit. When I first got him, the previous owner let me know he's not real fond of trotting. So I thought, wow, a non-trotting, non-horse treating horse, <laughs> who again is sensitive. But now he, uh, as you can see, he loves his treats and he trots. Still not a big fan of it, but he'll do it. And then we uh, lope a little bit. Some days we'll do some drills. And other than that, just keep him legged up and ready to go out and make a run on a weekend. So my first time ever entering a barrel race was the big NBHA Super Show at the South Point. And it was my first barrel race ever, ever, ever. <laughs> and everybody kept saying, does that girl know that there's jackpots she could enter? And I said to my girlfriend, well, I don't understand. I mean, it's just three trash cans and dirt. Why, why does it matter if I'm entering this or a jackpot? And she was like, don't you worry about it. You just go out there. I was tickle picked that I just made an 18 second run and it's in the 14s that win it. <laughs> But I could not have been happier. And hey, what a beautiful venue. So that, how fun is that? Right? Yeah. Well, even when I got six, that was the first race. Same thing. Mm -hmm. I had tried him in Montana, which was an absolute disaster. How that horse is even in my backyard is a story in its own. They opened the gate, and when they had said to me, he's a sensitive horse, I thought, oh, he gets his feelings hurt. Well, now I know that a sensitive horse is he's hotter than a $2 bill. And that gate opened, and I went to, to face him to the gate, and all of a sudden, he went to gun it, and I'm like, ah! I mean, I am holding him with a death grip. At that point, he's wanting to go, and he's spinning left and right. I slammed him into a panel. I took off a hide off the back of his oh head. 
finally, everybody's yelling at me to get in and make a run, and my girlfriend's yelling, if you want to step up and be a big girl, you better get in there before I slap him on the butt. There was so much going on. I was like, I just want everybody to stop yelling. Well, I held him up to first, and they said, what happened to you? The backside of first, you just relaxed into it, you sat down, and all of a sudden you got up and started riding. And the announcer says, well, she just smoked a beautiful run. It looks like 76 is heading to Vegas. Oh my gosh. Walked out of the arena. He was still hotter than a $2 bill. I'm shaking. He's like, get off me. And I said, I'll take him. <laughs> oh, and he okay. is a sweetie. I actually, and I actually called Dina after a race in Laughlin, and I had really worked on the perfect circle and really kept him quiet, which before, if I had ever done that in a holding pen, I mean, he would have just been, you know, what? And, you know, let me go and that kind of thing. But now it doesn't intimidate me. Now it actually, if he doesn't act like that, I'm like, oh my God, there's something wrong with right. him. Like, what's going <laughs> on? It's, oh, I'm a, I'm a freak. Okay, so I want to tell one more funny story about when you first started from our, our buddy Winter shared this with me. <laughs> her being yes. horse knowledgeable, yes. called you, you called her up and said his poop doesn't look right. I'm a freak about that kind of stuff. Yes, every day I will go in, I will look at poop, I will look at water. Like I said, I run my hands up and down. And so I was so concerned. I took a picture, texted it to Winter. I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> she starts laughing. She goes, the birds are eating it. <laughs> <laughs> but you thought because it was spread out that he was sick. I thought there was absolutely something wrong with him because I know this horse inside and out so anything that's out of the norm but yeah we we get a giggle about that that's still. so funny so funny i trust myself in my career i have a confidence level i know what i'm doing and he allows me to feel that with him the confidence the confidence it took a lot it took a lot for me to really be able to trust him and i, I think for me when i go out there at night you know I, I work a nine ten hour day and when i go out there it's my two hours with him i don't take my phone I don't worry if the restaurants are going to catch on fire, somebody's going to put it out. But this is my time with him. And there's nights that I will literally just sit on the edge of the trailer and we'll just talk, him and me. Oh, that makes me want to tear up because my horses have always been that person. Yeah. There was nobody, not my parents, I have great parents, but I would just go to the barn and hug the horse because that was all that made my teenage years okay. Well, it is. Like, I, I mean, the other day, I literally, I did. I had such a bad day. It I don't was know, super, super me. stressful. And I literally was sitting on the edge of my trailer like this. <laughs> and I just, all of a sudden, just felt him just breathing on me. Like, I'm here. You know, I'm here. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and I went from being sad to all of a sudden being happy. And, you know, let's get out and ride. And there is the beauty of a horse. I don't think anybody realizes unless you have them around you to understand what they do for your soul. I don't think so either. That is. So I think you can see from earlier today at the restaurant, we obviously deal with a very high-end clientele. And I think it was actually a lot of fun when a lot of my VIPs were like, you know, you actually get dirty? And I'm like, yeah, actually I get dirty. I might work a nine or 10 hour day, or I might make a drive home from California or Utah, and I've been on the road for four or five hours, and I get here at nine o'clock at night, and I have to exercise him, and I have to keep him going, because it's not fair for me. He doesn't ask to be loaded up and, and taken down the road to a barrel race or a rodeo. So for me, it's really important that I keep him exercised and I keep him happy and I keep him on the right feed program and I make sure that everything about him is happy and healthy. So find some clinics by trainers that are very well known. Like when I found out that Dina Kirkpatrick was coming, I think I was the first one to actually sign up for her clinic. Um, very fortunate, Judy Millimackie is who trains six. I've worked with Judy, I've worked with Rachel Millimackie, I was fortunate enough to go to Texas and Molly Powell helped me and take a little bit of something from everybody. And then you gotta learn to kind of apply it to your style. The horse is it, the horse is really it. Um, when I got six, my girlfriend had to really sell him on me. You know, she's like, he's a 14 year old, he's an old campaigner, he's been there, he's done that. And I was like, oh, 14 years old, how much time would I have left with him? But she sold me on him and I'm really glad that she did because for someone that was new and, and coming along and looking for that step up horse, he taught me, like he raised me in this barrel world. You know, the first year he, he scared me a lot. You know, he was a lot of horse for me. And you know, I'd go to, to set him in a turn and sit down and he'd be like, no, 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 you know, it's, it's here. And I'd be like, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. But now, I mean, we're a team, you know, and he waits for me now. But I would have never been able to have that experience or know what that feeling is if I wasn't fortunate enough to have a horse like Six. It makes my heart so happy. Like, I don't think I could ever explain 
This horse has taught me about commitments. He's taught me about trust. He's built my confidence. He's done everything for me. He really showed me what this game of barrel racing is. And the best thing that I could ever do for him is make sure that he's always happy and he's always healthy.